Volkswagen has reimagined what its Golf family hatchback should be, this 8th generation model packaged very differently from its predecessor. Under the skin, hybrid engineering is prevalent further up the range, but for potential buyers, what will probably matter most is the more distinctive look and the classy, minimalist, digitalised cabin. Loyal Golf owners will find lots to like here. An awful lot has happened to Volkswagen since the Golf was first launched back in 1974, replacing the classic Beetle 35 million sales ago. One thing hasn't changed though, this enduring family hatchback is still the brand's most important model and the one that most fundamentally defines it. So what of this eighth generation version launched in early 2020? Might it be all the car you'd ever need? If it isn't, we might not see another Golf generation, and there have, of course, been plenty to date. There was the promise of the Mark I Type 17 series car in 1974, which then rather quickly visually entered middle age with the Mark II Type 19E series version of 1983 and the Mark III Type 1H design of 1991. A cleaner, sharper looking Mark IV Type 1J series Golf model followed in 1997, which Volkswagen tried to make a little plusher with the Mark V Type 1K series model of 2006 and the barely changed Mark VI Type 5K series design that very quickly followed it in 2008. Perhaps the biggest change in Golf history came with this current car's predecessor, the Mark VII Type 5G series car that launched in 2012. The first car in the Volkswagen Group to adopt that conglomerate's all new MQB modular matrix transverse platform for its compact models, a chassis still used today. That seventh generation model was significantly updated in 2017 to see out the decade until the launch of the car we're going to look at here. These previous Golf designs encapsulated what family hatchback motoring used to be. What it will be in the future is surely closer to a car some might see as a Golf replacement, a model Volkswagen already sells, the ID3. So there have to be new and more compelling reasons why this car should retain its commanding position in the Volkswagen model range, should retain its existence at all. Merely another dose of the things that have marked out the evolution of the seven previous Golf generations, a quality feel and carefully progressive design, simply won't cut it. All that being the case, it's initially a little disappointing then to find so much carried over from before. There's much the same MQB platform and the fundamentals of most of the engines haven't changed much either. Because of the ID3, there's no all-electric version anymore, and the GTE plug-in model's basic powertrain dates back to 2016. But if you're loyal to the Golf model line, as so many customers are, don't despair. This car has tried to reinvent itself, most notably with this more fashionable front-end look, which, as it turns out, is more than just mere window dressing. There's a completely new digitalized cabin, mild hybrid technology can now feature beneath the bonnet, and there's the kind of media and safety tech that until a few years ago, family hatch folk could only dream about. Best of all, the Golf remains what a lot of people still want it to be, a family hatch with the quality of a premium brand model at a price close to that of the volume maker offerings in this segment. As one former Volkswagen Group chairman once pointed out, the biggest mistake any Volkswagen Golf can make is to stop being a Golf. This Mark 8 model hasn't made that error, but has it done enough for continued success in this segment? We're about to find out. So it's a Golf. You don't want anything too extreme from the driving experience on offer here, just a polished, definitive expression of the way a quality family hatch can be made to travel. But customer perceptions of that definition have evolved and changed in the years since the last generation of Golf hit our roads. Has this Mark 8 car kept up? 
Well, plenty's new to make sure that it does a fully digital at the wheel experience and the optional embellishment of mild hybrid engines and self-driving tech. Just what has this Volkswagen become? On the move, Golf regulars will certainly feel right at home with it. As ever, there's a real polish to this car, not only in the way it's built, and the way it looks, but also in the way it drives. Get used to this current design and you'll find that as with its predecessor, progress can be effortless thanks to a combination of stability, poise and control that makes journey times shrink rapidly. Directional stability is exemplary. As before, no other family hatch betters this one if long journeys must be a regular part of your motoring life. Superb refinement helps here too, something that's particularly marked out the Golf ever since it was mated to the VW Group's rigidly sophisticated MQB platform. Add in the clever engine and suspension mounts that are part of that, the painstaking attention paid to powertrain installation and the benefits of a sound deadening acoustic windscreen, and you can begin to understand just why after using this car, a drive in an ordinary rival mainstream focus class family hatch can seem so noisy. That'll be evident whichever power plant you choose. The mainstream TSI petrol range still built around 1 litre and 1.5 litre units. The latter now with the option of that mild hybrid ETSI tech I just mentioned. We'll get to that. Talking of electrification, there's no full battery powered e-golf available these days. Uh, VW's futuristic ID3 hatch has taken up that button, but TDI diesel variants continue, these now exclusively being of the 2 litre variety. Select a faster flavour of petrol or diesel power, and as usual you'll be offered the option of a 7-speed DSG Auto gearbox as an alternative to the standard 6-speed manual. That DSG self-shifter, now improved with faster take-up from rest, one of our previous criticisms of it. So far, so familiar, yet progress has also been made with this 8th generation design. This car does more than just drive like a Golf turns sharply into a bend and if you happen to be familiar with the previous Mark 7 version you'll notice that this Golf 8 responds a little more directly especially in the first few degrees of lock so its reactions feel fractionally faster allowing you to more confidently place it at corner entry. That feeling's even more pronounced if you've ever fitted with the progressive steering setup that's on top models that uses complicated algorithms to reduce the amount of steering angle necessary for any given turn. That particular feature was first developed for the last generation Golf GTI, as was the standard XDS electronic differential lock system that continues to be standard across the Golf range. Now XDS lightly brakes the inside front wheel during tight turns, sharpening turn in and ensuring that all the power gets onto the tarmac. Most rivals offer similar torque vectoring packages, and some competitors, notably Ford's Focus and the Mazda 3, offer a degree more feedback and handling involvement, but the accuracy and precise driving dynamics here still really impress. As before, the model lineup has been effectively split in half by Volkswagen's decision to adopt two quite different rear suspension systems across the range. Back in the noughties, Mark V and Mark VI generation Golfs were always distinguished by their sophisticated multi-link rear suspension setups that provided such an exemplary ride and handling balance. But in 2012, at the launch of the Mark VII model, the Wolfsburg bean counters decreed that only Golf variants with more than 150 PS could have this package, and nothing's changed since. We remain disappointed by this, but from a pragmatic perspective, it is perhaps possible to understand their point of view. After all, will the largely undemanding drivers who choose lower order goals really notice that their cars must ride on unsophisticated torsion beam suspension that's cheaper for the Wolfsburg factory to assemble? Almost certainly not. The difference between the two setups only really becomes evident over very poor services or if you're throwing the car about on a country road, both scenarios in which the more sophisticated multi-link rear suspension setup will leave this Golf far more composed. If you're bothered by this and really don't want to stretch to a version of this car with 150 PS or more, 
I'd suggest that the extra cost DCC dynamic chassis control adaptive damping setup would be a really good options box to tick. The DCC package has now been improved with no fewer than 15 settings and it's been freshly connected to a so-called driving dynamics manager system that allows it to coordinate with that XDS torque vectoring system I mentioned earlier so as to select the right control system at the right time for any driving maneuver. It all means that dynamic chassis control can make quite a difference to this Golf's drive demeanor once you've taken the time to fiddle about with it. And the DCC package comes complete with a driving mode system, a standard feature on some segment rivals these days, but optional here, unless you get yourself quite a fancy trim level. Volkswagen's mode setup is called Driver Profile Selection and offers three available programs, Sport, Normal and Individual, which alter throttle response, steering feel, engine management, and on DSG Auto models, gear shift timings to suit your chosen driving style. Plus, there's a further comfort mode if you've got the DCC damping setup fitted. Earlier, I mentioned engines. You're probably going to need to know a little more about them. The two base TSI Petro units, a three cylinder one litre unit with 110 PS and a four cylinder 1.5 with 130 PS, both come only with six speed manual transmission. Both put out exactly the same 200 Newton meter torque figure and both return exactly the same efficiency readings, though the performance stats of the 1.5 rest to 62 miles an hour in 9.2 seconds en route to 133 miles an hour are a second and seven miles an hour quicker than the one litre variant can manage. Though you probably won't care too much about that, the fact that the smaller unit can only be had with the most spartan level of trim will probably decide things in the four cylinder power plant's favour if you're browsing at the bottom end of the Golf lineup. Another £1,000 over the 1.5 gets you the only other Golf variant with the cruder torsion beam suspension setup, the base diesel, now not a 1.6, but a detuned 115 PS version of the brand's 2 litre TDI unit. Here, pulling power rises by 50%, but the basic performance stats are the same as those of the three-cylinder petrol unit. Rest to 62 miles an hour in 10.2 seconds on the way to 126 miles an hour. I'd suggest, though, that dynamically, to experience everything this car can be, you need to at least try a version with the more sophisticated multi-link rear suspension setup that I was referencing earlier. There's a 2 litre TDI diesel model with 150 PS, an auto only variant that makes 62 miles an hour in 8.8 .8 seconds on the way to 139 miles an hour. But your more likely starting point in the range if you're wanting a more sophisticatedly suspended Golf is probably going to be the variant that we've chosen to test today. The 1.5 litre TSI petrol engine in its uprated 150 PS form mated to six speed manual transmission. This is an appealing combination. The gearbox is slick, the engine's willing, and the performance more than sufficient. Rest to 62 miles an hour in eight and a half seconds, en route to 139 miles an hour. This 1.5 TSI 150 PS unit can also be had with the VW Group's latest mild hybrid tech, but for reasons best known to the Wolfsburg engineers, only if you order it with the optional seven speed DSG auto gearbox. It's easy to get terminologies mixed up here. Like the mild hybrid tech that Ford uses, this isn't any kind of proper full hybrid, the sort of thing that might be capable of providing Prius-like periods of electric-only driving. There's nothing like that. Volkswagen's overall objective instead here being to make its engines more efficient by smoother transitions between driving, cruising, and resting. To that end, there's an integrated 48 volt BAS uh, belt alternator starter generator that powers a 12 volt main electrical setup in which a 48 volt compact lithium ion battery in the boot stores energy harvested via a Kurs kinetic energy recovery system. That additional electricity might be used either to boost the engine while accelerating or to restart it when the stop start system kicks in at low speeds, or this surplus energy might be directed to help power ancillary functions. 
as long as you limit your expectations to these things, the mild hybrid tech here has actually been developed to deliver, rather than wanting eye-catching Prius-style efficiency figures, you should be pretty satisfied with the way that all this works in a Golf 1.5 ETSI in practice. Thanks to the electrical assistance, uh, refinement is even better and enough battery boost is generated for the petrol engine to be rarely bothered for acceleration duties around town. As advertised, there's a fraction more accelerative boost too, though that isn't reflected by performance figures which exactly replicate those of the manual 1.5 TSI 150 PS model. Volkswagen can also pair the E-TSI tech with two lower powered TSI petrol engines and presumably with the diesels too, but chose not to do so at the launch of this Golf 8 model. But as I've just mentioned, an E-TSI version of this car isn't a proper hybrid. If you want a Golf that is, you'll need the GTE model. This is a PHEV plug-in hybrid. It was actually one of the first cars to use this tech in the compact segment. And the Golf GTE still uses basically the same mechanical configuration as it did originally back in 2016. A 150 PS 1.4 litre TSI petrol engine mated to a six speed DSG auto gearbox. What's changed this time round though is that the 85 kilowatt electric motor this package works with is mated to a lithium ion battery that's 50% bigger, narrated up at 13 kilowatt hours, quite a large capacity for a plug-in hybrid model. That's why the WLTP all-electric driving range has increased substantially to 36 miles and why the all-electric top speed has improved to 80 miles an hour. The GTE's total engine and electric motor output is rated at 245 PS, which perhaps not coincidentally is exactly the output of the eighth generation version of the Golf GTI hot hatch. With the GTI, an evolved version of the usual two litre TSI petrol turbo power plant still continues, now with 370 Newton meters of torque. With the even faster Golf R hot hatch, that same engine is tuned out to 330 PS, hence the need for a standard four motion four wheel drive system. Completing the range of further Golf options, there's the GTD, an auto only diesel hot hatch variant with a GTI style handling setup that uses the two litre TDI engine in a 200 PS state of tune. Whatever flavour of Golf you happen to prefer, it'll come with the fresh generation of drive assist technology that's been ushered in by this 8th generation model. So let's finish this section by briefing you on that. What's important to understand here is the switch from passive to active technology. Previously, the optional ACC adaptive cruise control system, now standard across the range, merely braked and accelerated the car based around a preset speed. Now, it uses the car's front camera system, GPS data, and a whole host of sensors to drive the car predictively. So when ACC is set, the car knows in advance about bends, roundabouts, and upcoming traffic flow. Plus this Golf will adapt itself to speed limits as you enter them. Adaptive cruise control is also an integral part of this car's clever new travel assist system, which is either standard or optional depending on the trim level you select, and enables partially assisted so-called level two autonomous driving. The old Mark 7 Golf model's traffic jam assist setup had an element of this, pairing adaptive cruise control technology with lane assist adaptive lane guidance so that the car could effectively drive itself in traffic queues. But because that tech would only work at up to 37 miles an hour, it was only good for urban conditions. So Volkswagen has a developed travel assist from it, which also works with uh, adaptive cruise control and lane assist, but provides partially assisted driving at highway speeds of up to 130 miles an hour. That's made possible by the integration of the predictive technology that I just mentioned, and the addition here of a new capacitive steering wheel, which has to sense your hands upon its rim. Otherwise, if warnings are ignored, it'll disable all the drive systems and bring the car to a gradual stop at the side of the road. This is all the kind of technology we think a typical buyer of this Golf will really like. This remains the most sophisticated volume brand family hatch in existence with a cool, classless feel that no other rival can quite replicate. We wish it wasn't quite so expensive, but nice things cost, and this is one of them.
Golf has always been one of those cars that almost everyone recognises. That should continue with this 8th generation version, but you certainly know in advance that it was a slightly more progressive interpretation of a classic theme. An indicator of the present, according to head of Volkswagen Group design Klaus Bischoff. Its design, he says, represents the evolution of millions of people feeling at home. Well, if you're a Golf follower, you'd certainly feel at home with the look of this car in profile. The C-pillar design has been a distinctive element of this and every Golf since 1974, supposed to represent the drawn string of a bow, giving the Golf the look of acceleration even when it's standing still. There's also this more defined mid-level swage line running from the leading edge of the front doors to the rear lights. The silhouette here seems a little more stretched and dynamic than before, but actually the compact dimensions aren't that much different to those of the previous generation model, though it is 26 millimeters longer. What's certainly changed is the aerodynamics, which is why you've got these CD optimized exterior mirrors and slicker finishing in areas you can't see, the underbody panelling and the wheel housing liners, for instance. Now, the result is a drag coefficient cut by 10% to 0.27 CD. And of course, to suit the mood at the moment, the aerodynamically optimized wheels can be big. Rim sizes starting at 16 inches and raising up to 19 inches. We've got 17 inch Belmont style rims here. The main talking point though is the way the designers have changed the front end with its lower nose and slimmer grille flanked by full LED headlights. It's a look that golf regulars may have to work at getting used to. As one writer pointed out, initially the combination of the low nose and the way the headlamps are topped by these narrow LED strips tends to deliver the look of someone peering disapprovingly at you over the top of their spectacles. At least it makes this car really noticeable on the road though. And when was the last time you could have said that about a Golf? On the style spec model and on upper sporting variants, there's a bit of extra pavement theater in the form of an LED light strip that extends across the radiator grille to create continuous illumination with the headlights. Plus, as usual with this Volkswagen, uh, different front bumper styling varies with different trim levels. Beneath which, these wavy serrated corner sections are certainly a talking point above base trim, incorporating these two body colored upper fins and a silvered lower one that flows into a thin silver lower trim strip, framing the bottom half of the lower grille. If you want to look for signs of cost cutting, you'll have to look quite carefully, though some of that is in evidence when you lift the bonnet, which doesn't use the gas struts you'd expect on a premium orientated product, relying on this simple manual arm. Now Volkswagen says this is because the Golf 8 adopts two bonnet latches instead of a single one. At the back, there's the same clean, sharp finishing that's always pleased Golf customers, but perhaps more of a chiseled look this time round, with wide LED tail lamp clusters and a more sculpted bumper arrangement, disguising the fact that this eighth generation model is 10 millimeters narrower and sits 36 millimeters lower than its predecessor. This hatch variant is joined as usual in the range by an estate version, and both sit on the supremely flexible MQB modular transverse matrix chassis that has underpinned countless VW Group models since the previous Mark 7 model Golf first introduced it back in 2012. If you think the look of the outside of this Mark 8 Golf has evolved though, you've not seen anything yet. Just wait till you see inside. Volkswagen calls the interior of this car a digital revolution. 
I'm not sure I'd go quite that far. It's not massively different from being in a similarly sized Volkswagen Group family hatch with big screens for both dash and instrument binnacle. Uh, the latest versions of the Audi A3, the Skoda Octavia and the Seat Leon all use basically the same technology. But with this so-called InnoVision cockpit layout, Volkswagen has packaged it all in an intuitive way that I think Golf regulars will really like. I'll get to that after I've reassured you that the quality here is satisfyingly golf-like. The classy full-width strip of vents we first saw in the Mark 8 Passat embellishes the mid-level of the fascia below a smart trim-dependent decor strip. This one's finished in brushed dark metal and it helps that ambient multicolored lighting is now standard and that the lower center console is now much wider delivering something of the feel of a larger more expensive car. Can it all equal the allure of premium brand models in this segment like the BMW 1 Series, the Mercedes A-Class or this Golf's close cousin the Audi A3 Sportback? Almost, yes. It's certainly far nicer than the cabins of most other volume branded rivals. Of course, it's the cockpit digitalization that plays the greatest part in achieving that. We first saw this Mark 8 Golf model's inner vision concept in the large Touareg SUV. The idea being that this 10 inch digital cockpit pro digital instrument binnacle screen seems to visually flow into the big standard 10 inch center dash infotainment monitor. This may be an all digital dashboard, but it's conservatively presented with separate capacitive buttons grouped in two shiny piano black clusters, one either side of the steering wheel. There's certainly plenty to master on first acquaintance, but even if you're of a maturity that predates the digital age, you probably won't feel it's beyond you. Let's start with this Digital Cockpit Pro instrument binnacle screen. It's a little smaller than the virtual cockpit screen that you get in Audis, but it works in much the same way. A view button on the steering wheel offering a choice of four graphic layouts. Mainly you'll use this one with two virtual dials, each centrally incorporating info with the pair of gauges separated by a central data panel. All of it completely customizable. Further clicks on the view button scroll you through three more themes, a safety graphic, a full navigation map, and a digital speedo with in each case customizable data boxes provided to the left and to the right. You can choose for the left hand gauge or box to display consumption info or a gear indicator, a fuel gauge, assistance system info or operating temperatures. The right hand dial or box can show driving time or average speed, navigation info, your audio preferences, phone settings, uh, speed, acceleration, a compass or destination info. When the virtual dials are in place, the center part of the screen can show things like the time, trip computer, data, a digital speedo and road sign info. Anything this instrument binnacle display can't tell you, and much that it can, will be covered off by that 10 inch center dash touch screen that I mentioned earlier, which is a decent step forward from the composition media monitor fitted to the previous generation model, which already was better than rival setups. This replacement Discover Media Navigation system puts the Golf even further beyond its competitors reach in this regard when it comes to clarity and ease of use. You'll have to get used to a few things about it though, uh, primarily the curious slider at the bottom of the screen for volume control which not everyone likes. If you hate this feature you'll be pleased to find that more conventional volume buttons are provided on the steering wheel. The main centre screen menu allows you to choose from key options like radio media, phone, navigation, vehicle, uh, app connect media settings and assist systems. There's a built-in eSIM that enables you to create a Wi-Fi hotspot and you can hold and drag display icons to move them around or you can swipe across to a split screen that will enable you to for instance display a sat nav map, Bluetooth, car info and phone settings all at the same time. Uh, there's also an online shop that will allow you to upgrade certain elements of the car's technology after you've bought it using over-the-air updates that will allow Volkswagen to potentially improve the screen's functionality over time too. Upgrade this monitor to Extra Cross Discover Media Navigation Pro form and you also get gesture control, which I could do without, and an intuitive voice control system, Hello Volkswagen. 
What can I do for you? I really like that. Uh, with the voice setup, you preface anything you want to say to the car by either pressing on a steering wheel button or saying, hello, Volkswagen. It then responds with either yes, please, or what would you like me to do? And reacts obediently to voice commands like go to Milton Keynes, activating navigation, or I'm cold, activating the air conditioning. Clever digital microphones are able to ensure clear voice recognition and also locate the person who's speaking, either the driver or the front seat passenger. So if the front passenger asks for the heated seat to be switched on, for instance, the system will recognise the identity of the questioner and only activate the front passenger's heated seat. Neat. I haven't found the voice set up to be foolproof, though. You think, for instance, when following a smoky truck, the command turn on the air recirculation would do the necessary. It doesn't. You have to say, it smells. Enough with screens and digitalization. What else do you need to know here? Maybe that the ergonomics are predictably faultless and that the seats, which come with lumbar adjustment, are brilliantly supportive too. And look great when above entry level trim they're upholstered in this stitched art velours cloth upholstery. DSG Auto Gearbox models now get a smaller Porsche style shift by wire stubby lever that's almost like an electric switch, which frees up space on the centre console for extra stowage. On the subject of storage, there's a big air conditioned glove box, uh, large flock line door bins, which can each hold a 500 milliliter bottle of water, plus you get a lidded bin between the seats. There's a neat touch in this central cup holder with an attachment that springs out to better clasp a smaller cup, though it feels a bit flimsy. Plus, there's a 12 volt socket nearby, a ticket clip in the driver's sun visor, and a sewage net in the front passenger footwell. Not everything's ideal though. Uh, Volkswagen's forgotten an overhead sunglasses compartment. You got that in the old car. Uh, there are no media ports in the bin between the seats and the uh, ports that you do get above this recessed area in front of the gear stick um, are of the USB-C variety, so you have to have this unsightly converter lead. Plus, the left-hand capacitive screen panel has an annoying blanked out lower right section reminding you of its ability to further control some kind of extra feature that you didn't quite have enough money to pay for. Still, for every tiny foible, there are two or three other features you'll probably really like. Maybe the way the storage boxes are flock lined so that your keys don't scrape around on the move. Uh, the upholstered material used for the upper section of the dashboard that's lovely to the touch. The central armrest that tops that bin between the seats and adjusts for five stages of height. Or perhaps just the way that the gearbox lever is just the right height to sit comfortably in your hand. The combination of these tiny front quarter lights and slim A pillars mean good frontward vision too. Over the shoulder vision isn't quite as good, the large C pillars rather get in the way, so it's just as well that rear parking sensors are standard fit. Let's take a seat in the rear. These large square rear door openings make it easy to get in and out without having to lower your head. Thanks to the extra 16 millimeters of length between the wheels with this Mark 8 design, there's a fraction more legroom than there was before. So a pair of six foot adults could now be accommodated reasonably here, providing front seat occupants don't slide their seats fully back. There's certainly a little more space here than there would be in premium badge family hatches outside of the Volkswagen Group that a Golf buyer might be considering, like the BMW 1 Series or the Mercedes A-Class. A Focus is more spacious though, and in a Skoda Octavia you'd get loads more room. As we said with the previous generation model, we're disappointed that the height of this centre transmission tunnel makes it so difficult for middle seat passengers to be comfortably accommodated. Two people should be quite happy though, and provided that there are only two of you, you'll be able to benefit from this fold down centre armrest with its twin cup holders and twin overhead reading lights sit in the ceiling panel here. Uh, seat back pockets are provided, plus with each seat back you also get these neat couple of upper pouches too. The door bins are unimaginatively designed, but they incorporate decently sized flock lined illuminated bins. 
There are twin USB ports, though again, they're of the smaller USB-C variety. And with the optional three zone climate system fitted, you get this rear seat temperature control panel too. Let's finish this segment by taking a look in the boot. The catch for which, as usual, is activated by pushing this center tailgate badge. Your Volkswagen salesperson may well be keen to reference the fact that the 381 litre space provided here is 40 litres more than you get in a rival Ford Focus. They're less likely to point out though that this Golf's capacity is still significantly down on what you'd find in segment rivals like Skoda's Octavia, Honda's Civic and Peugeot's 308. Still, the room you do get is very usable and a small set of golf clubs or a baby buggy would easily fit. This is a very flexible area too, thanks to this adjustable height boot floor that sits above the spare wheel compartment, which doesn't house a spare wheel unless you pay extra for it. The wide hatch aperture and the low loading sill height also help if you're trying to get heavy or bulky items inside. There's a 12 volt socket and two bag hooks, plus you get a cool white boot light, these small left and right corner storage compartment areas, and a ski hatch so that longer items can be poked through into the cabin. There are four tie down points, but rather meanly, only the further two of them are chromed. It's a little disappointing given this Volkswagen's premium aspirations that you don't get the 40-20-40 rear seat back split you'd find in an A-Class or a 1 Series. Pushing forward the conventional 60-40 split rear bench uh, that you do get frees up 1,237 litres of space across a load area that'll be virtually flat if you have the boot floor in its upper position. If you do need lots of regular cargo versatility, you'll obviously be better off choosing the Golf Estate body style. The mainstream five door hatchback Golf range we're focusing on here is spread across three trim levels. Life, this mid-range style version, and more sporty looking R-Line spec and pricing sits in the 23,000 to 30,000 pound bracket. About 35% of Golf 8 sales will be to retail with the remaining 65% to fleet, which is roughly in line with the previous generation model. As with that old car, a little disappointingly, only variants with 150 PS or more get properly sophisticated multi-link rear suspension. Otherwise, there's a cruder torsion beam setup. You'll venture up towards £35,000 if you start looking at variants like the GTE plug-in hybrid, that's a 1.4 litre petrol TSI, and the GTI hot hatch, which uses a 2 litre petrol TSI unit. They both develop 245 PS. Or the GTD performance diesel, which uses a 2 litre TDI unit with 200 PS. Think closer to £40,000 if you want the Golf R Super Hatch, which offers four motion four wheel drive and uses a version of the Golf GTI's 2 litre TSI turbo petrol engine tuned out to 330 PS. But those four more sophisticated Golf derivatives aren't our focus here. The all electric E Golf has been discontinued. That spot in the range has been filled by the battery powered ID3 model. The three-door hatch Golf body style was dropped ages ago because hardly anyone wanted it, and there's no replacement for the old Golf SV Compact MPV, nor does Volkswagen seem to have any plans to revive the Golf Cabriolet. All of which has briefed you on what you now can and can't have golf-wise. So let's now get back to our focus on the mainstream range, where the alternative body style to this five-door hatch is, as usual, an estate, which, as ever with a golf wagon, boasts the most spacious load bay in its class. Right, let's talk about engines, the two lowest powered versions of which come only with six-speed manual transmission. Things kick off with a one litre TSI turbo petrol unit offering 110 PS, but that's offered only with base life trim. If you are shopping at the very base of the range, it's probably better to find the extra 600 pounds that Volkswagen wants for the lower tuned 130 PS version of its 1.5 TSI petrol unit.
That 130 PS 1.5 TSI engine is offered with all three trim levels and with any of them another 600 pounds will bring you up to the level of a Golf with multi-link rear suspension and get you this unit in the 150 PS form that we're trying here. Though by that time you'll be up to a starting point of around 25,000 pounds. From launch this 1.5 TSI 150 PS unit was the only mainstream model Golf petrol engine that you could have mated to a DSG auto gearbox. The auto costing an extra £1,890 over the cost of the six speed manual box that we've been trying here. That might sound a big premium for auto transmission but that's because the DSG option in this case also gets you Volkswagen's latest 48 volt mild hybrid technology, which is why the Golf 1.5 TSI auto variant in question is actually badged 1.5 E TSI. That E TSI derivative might actually be a better alternative to some kind of Golf diesel. TDI models are priced from around £25,000 and this time around there are two engines on offer, both 2 litres in capacity. There's a 115 PS unit which comes mated only to a 6 speed manual transmission or a 150 PS 2 litre TDI power plant that can only be had mated to a 7 speed DSG auto. It's the base diesel for life trim and the top diesel for R-Line spec. You have to have this mid-range style trim level to get the choice of both these TDI options, in which case there's a premium of nearly £3,000 to go from the lower to the higher powered model. As mentioned earlier, if you can afford much more, the further TDI option is the 200 PS version of this 2 litre black pump fueled unit that's fitted to the desirable performance orientated Golf GTD. Enough on the Golf lineup. What are your other options if you're considering this car? Well, we'll start within the Volkswagen range. A little less than you'd pay for a Golf would get you Volkswagen's all electric ID3, but then the scourge of range anxiety beckons. Or you could choose a mid sized Volkswagen SUV crossover, either one a fraction smaller than a Golf, the T Rock, for a little less, or one fractionally bigger than a Golf, the Tiguan. Or a little more. Let's assume though that you'd like a conventionally engined family hatchback of similar size to a Golf. Uh, what are your options from other volume brands? Well we should probably start with the three Volkswagen Group family hatchback models that share almost identical engineering with this one and explore pricing with these revealing that you've really got to want this Golf. You'd expect, of course, that an equivalently engined Seat Leon or Skoda Octavia would be cheaper than this Volkswagen, but by two and a half to three thousand pounds? That'll be the kind of price difference you'll be looking at if you're considering the two lower powered Golf petrol engines and comparing them to their Leon or Octavia equivalents. If you're looking at the base 115 PS 2 litre TDI diesel engine, the premium for Golf ownership over a Leon or Octavia is more in the region of around 1500 to 2000 pounds. Perhaps even more sobering for a Golf fan is that a petrol powered Audi A3 Sportback 30 TFSI can be yours for nearly a thousand pounds less than an identically engined Golf 1 litre TSI, though pricing would be more similar if you matched spec for spec. A base diesel A3 Sportback 30 TDI costs about the same as its Golf 2 litre TDI 115 PS equivalent. It all makes you think, doesn't it? There's better news for Volkswagen when it comes to consideration of competing family hatchback models outside of VW Group brands. There are two really key ones in our market and neither can offer the sheer quality of a Golf. A Ford Focus in volume 1 litre T 125 PS petrol form would save you only around £1,000 over an equivalent Golf 1 litre TSI and the Ford doesn't really have an engine that can properly compete to the Golf's volume 1.5 TSI petrol unit. A base Focus 1.5 EcoBlue diesel 120 PS model can undercut a base Golf 2 litre TDI 115 PS by quite a large amount, nearly £2,500, but the Focus will also cost you significantly more to run. 
The other key volume brand family hatchback segment player in our market is Vauxhall's Astra. Well, as you might expect, that's way cheaper than a Golf. Think around four and a half thousand pounds for base petrol and diesel models. But you get what you don't pay for. The Vauxhall just doesn't have the quality feel or the cabin technology of this Volkswagen. And like the Ford, it won't hold its value anything like as well either. Those last comments also apply to the other significant players in this segment. Renault's Megane, uh, Citroen C4, Honda Civic, Hyundai's i30, Kia Seed and Peugeot's 308. Yes, they'd be cheaper. No, they wouldn't feel like a Golf. The kind of money you'd have to find for this VW would get you full hybrid technology in the form of Toyota's Corolla, but again, not the same kind of quality. Obviously, you could save a massive amount by opting for more budget-orientated family hatches like the Fiat Tipo or the Skoda Scala, but then the same comments apply to an even greater extent. We think the Mini Clubman or the Mazda 3 both get much closer to a Golf feel than any of the other rivals we've mentioned so far in terms of perceived quality. But if you're going to pay near Golf money for one of those, you might conceivably take the view that you might as well have stumped up for a Golf. Or for the two premium badge contenders in this class, the BMW 1 Series and the Mercedes A-Class. For reference, we'll tell you that equivalent versions of both of those cost around the same as you'd pay for a comparable Golf. So that's talked you through your options. If having considered them, you conclude, as many global buyers will, that there's nothing quite like a Golf, your mind might be made up by a bit of generosity on Volkswagen's part when it comes to standard spec. Is that what's been delivered here? Let's see. We were a little surprised to find it necessary to pay extra for carpet mats and a dust and pollen filter on the entry level life derivative, but otherwise even this base trim spec seems pretty well provided for. You get 16 inch Norfolk style alloy wheels, full LED self leveling headlights with separate LED daytime running lights, LED rear tail lamps, a rear tailgate spoiler, auto dimming headlights and auto wipers and an alarm. Standard interior features include climate controlled air conditioning, uh, a leather trimmed three spoke multifunction steering wheel, a load through ski hatch in the rear seat and an adjustable height boot floor. There are also niceties that you probably wouldn't expect with base trim like a wireless smartphone charger, a 10 color ambient lighting system and what Volkswagen calls Digital Cockpit Pro, a 10 inch high resolution TFT dash instrument binnacle display screen with customizable menus and information. Talking of infotainment, a big 10 inch center dash touchscreen is no longer a pricey extra for golf folk. It's now fitted across the range as part of the standard Discover Media Navigation Package, which comes with SatNav, a six speaker DAB audio system and Bluetooth. It's permanently connected to the internet via an embedded eSIM, enabling online music streaming and real time traffic information amongst other things, and also allowing for what Volkswagen calls an in-car shop, which allows you to purchase additional services over the air after vehicle purchase. Plus, there's the CarNet App Connect system that allows use of the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto MirrorLink systems that enable you to mirror the display of your smartphone onto the center dash screen. Up to 14 driver profiles can be saved on the infotainment system, settings such as radio stations, uh, air conditioning, map and route preferences are saved automatically according to whoever is driving. There's also a WeConnect app available, which will allow you to interact with your Golf via your smartphone when you're away from it. You'll be able to do things like lock or unlock the doors, uh, remotely activate the horn and indicators, get a vehicle status report, set the cabin ventilation so the car is cool or warm when you reach it. And these remote services can also help you locate your Golf if you've forgotten where you parked it. Talking of technology, 
there's a lot of standard driving tech too, principally the ACC Adaptive Cruise Control System, which incorporates predictive cruise control and uses images from a windscreen camera along with navigation data to adjust the car's speed ahead of bends and speed restrictions. Plus, of course, ACC can do all the usual things, adapting your golf speed to the vehicles ahead and, in the event of a tailback, bringing the car to a controlled stop and starting it off again without driver input. Another clever new standard integrated feature is Car2X, a system that communicates wirelessly with other Car2X enabled vehicles using Wi-Fi technology so as to share information and brief your Golf's electronic systems automatically on traffic updates. So, for instance, if you're stuck in a traffic jam, the system will know before you do when the end of the jam is coming up and will get the adaptive cruise control ready to resume cruising speeds. And Car2X incorporates a hazard warning system that advises you of impending roadworks, accidents and emergency vehicles. It can even detect when other cars with the system are performing panic braking in front of you and in such a, an emergency will turn on your own brake lights even before you've reacted to avoid you being rear-ended. Want more? Then you'll need to find the extra to get yourself a mid-range style spec model like this one. Style trimmed golfs get a smarter look, courtesy of larger 17-inch Belmont style alloy wheels, body-coloured front air intake fins, a chrome trimmed lower edge for the side window surround and an LED light strip across the radiator grille that creates continuous illumination with the headlights. At this level, those headlights are of the LED Plus variety, which means that they include a cornering function and poor weather lighting. Plus, the door mirrors are power folding and come with puddle lights. With style trim, the cabin gets an upgrade with front sport seats, art velour upholstery center sections, brushed dark metal decorative dash inserts, front footwell illumination, and an improved 30 color ambient lighting system. Plus the missing carpet mats and dust and pollen filter make an appearance. And there are some extra camera safety features we'll cover off in a moment. Or you could stretch to top Golf R-Line trim, which gets you an R-Line styling pack with sportier bumpers and tweaks to the radiator grille and side skirts, plus smarter grey metallic trimmed 17 inch Valencia alloy wheels, chromed exhaust pipes, rear privacy glass and lowered sport suspension. There's also a sportier look inside at this level, thanks to carbon grey decorative inserts in the dash and front doors, plus a black roof liner, stainless steel pedals, door sill inserts and R-line branding for the seats and steering wheel. Other R-Line spec features include heat for the steering wheel, a progressive steering system that makes low speed manoeuvring easier, and the driver profile selection driving mode setup that allows you to tweak steering and throttle feel to suit your mood, plus gear change timings too if you have a DSG Auto. On to options. Let's start with a few key ones. Your Volkswagen dealer is going to be keen for you to consider uh, upgrading the 10 inch center dash discover media navigation system to improved pro status which gets you integrated gesture control and perhaps most notably the Wolfsburg brand's latest intuitive voice activation system which can recognize common commands prefaced by the phrase hello Volkswagen the Discover Media Navigation Pro option also includes what Volkswagen calls WeConnect Plus preparation, which makes it possible to integrate online traffic information into route guidance and transfer online points of interest to the navigation system. WeConnect Plus media services also deliver online access to a range of useful information, such as traffic reports, petrol station locations and parking spots. You can further upgrade the infotainment screen by adding in a Harman Kardon 480 watt 9 speaker premium sound system. What about driver orientated extras? Well, there's a head up display. And if parking is a problem for you, there's a park assist system that will automatically steer you into a space. And there's a rear view camera too. 
the driver profile selection driving mode system that's fitted to our line spec models can be optioned in at extra cost with the lower trim levels. This setup will come included if you choose to pay more for DCC dynamic chassis control adaptive damping, a desirable option that only around 5% of Golf customers choose. Uh, you might also want to consider the piercing IQ light LED matrix headlamps, which can alter their beam by 22 separate LED lights that draw from GPS data, steering wheel angle and driving speed info, and can alter their illumination based on the type of road that you're on and the prevailing weather. Other features that you may want to add include a panoramic glass roof, uh, keyless entry and a digital key feature that with compatible smartphones will allow you to unlock the car with your handset. There are a few packs that you might want to look at. With base live spec there's a lounge pack which adds in the smarter ambient lighting system and the three zone climate control setup that you get with style spec. Across the range there's also a winter pack that gives you heated front seats, heated windscreen washer jets and a heated leather trim steering wheel too. Plus, heated rear seats can also be included if you want them, along with three-zone electronic air conditioning if the Golf trim level you've chosen doesn't already have it. Bear in mind that you'll almost certainly be paying your Volkswagen dealer more for your choice of paint color. Solid Urano Gray is the only standard shade. Appallingly, you even have to pay £375 more for solid pure white or the other solid colour, Moonstone Grey. You're probably, though, going to want one of the metallic or pearl effect shades like the lime yellow finish we have here. If you really want to splash out, there's a pricey premium signature finish, Oryx White. Uh, there are also various different 17 or 18 inch alloy wheel designs with availability depending on trim level and you can add in black or carbon trimmed door mirror caps and rear privacy glass too if the spec you've chosen doesn't already have it. As for the interior look, well you can add extra ambient lighting and art velours upholstery to the base life spec models but otherwise the cabin you pay for uh, further up the range is the cabin you get. What about practical options? Well, as you'd expect, you can specify a tow bar. This one's power detachable. And of course, you can add in roof bars so that roof boxes and holders for bicycles, skis and snowboards can be installed on top. A bicycle carrier can also be added to the tow bar and mud flaps are, of course, available too. For the boot area, you might want to add in a reversible luggage compartment mat or perhaps a luggage compartment tray or a load liner or perhaps a luggage net to keep small items from flying around. Annoyingly, you have to pay extra for a space saver spare wheel. Enough with options, let's take a look at driver assist systems and safety provision. You'd expect some sort of autonomous braking system on a car of this kind these days. Volkswagen's is called front assist and as usual with these sorts of setups, it scans the road ahead as you drive. If a potential collision hazard is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. For this Mark 8 Golf model, this uh, setup's city emergency braking system has been enhanced with predictive pedestrian protection, which is more specifically able to identify people or cyclists who might be about to inadvertently step into your path. Should this sort of situation happen, or if, for instance, another driver suddenly breaks in front of you, further help is provided by a Swerve Support Emergency Steering Assist system that's automatically activated as soon as you have to avoid an obstacle. After visual and acoustic warnings, this will introduce targeted braking intervention from the assistance system that'll help stabilize the car should you have to perform an evasive maneuver. Every Golf also gets a lane assist lane keeping system that warns you when you stray out of your lane and applies gentle steering assistance to ease you back into it. In addition, there's distance display warning, which alerts you if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front. Plus you get traffic sign recognition, which pictures speed signs as you pass and displays them on the center dash screen. 
All of this is in addition to all the more usual features that come fitted across the Golf range, which have helped to justify this car's five-star Euro NCAP safety test showing. There are twin front side and curtain airbags, though disappointingly you don't also get an extra one to protect the driver's knees. There are, of course, Isofix child seat fastenings on the rear bench, plus there's an active bonnet, a sensor-controlled pedestrian protection system that raises the bonnet away from the engine compartment in the nightmare scenario of an impact with a pedestrian so as to reduce injuries. Now, we also like the inclusion of an automatic post-collision braking system that recognizes when an impact has occurred and brakes the car to prevent it being uncontrollably propelled into oncoming traffic. It's also worth mentioning that one of the features of the WeConnect app that we mentioned earlier is an emergency call e-call system that in the event of an accident where the airbags are triggered will automatically alert the rescue services with your exact GPS location. Other conventional safety features include the normal ESC stability control and ASR traction control systems, plus MSR engine braking control that'll stop you skidding if you change down abruptly on a slippery surface. If you do get into a skid, a DSR steering assistance feature will help you steer out of it. And you get an ABS braking system further assisted by CBC cornering brake control through the bends plus an HBA hydraulic braking assistant, which helps reduce stopping time when you really slam on the anchors in an emergency. Plus all golfs get a hill hold function to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, plus tire pressure monitoring and a driver alert system that'll warn you if sensors detect drowsiness. That's the extent of the safety kit you get on Life and R-Line variants. With this mid-range style spec variant though, you get a bit more. Now, style models also get high beam assist to dip your headlights for you at night and side assist, essentially a blind spot alert system that'll warn you if you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. Both those last two features can be individually added into Life and R-Line variants. Also standard on a style spec Golf is a bit of technology that Volkswagen is very proud of. It's travel assist setup, which enables so-called level two autonomous driving at high speeds. Now, this is basically a development of the previous traffic jam assist system, which could accelerate, brake, steer, and maintain distance to the vehicles ahead. But whereas that previous automatic longitudinal and lateral guidance system could only be used at up to 37 miles an hour, travel assist can almost completely control the car for you at speeds of up to 130 miles an hour. That's providing you keep your hands on the new capacitive steering wheel. Though we read recently that taping an uncooked sausage to the steering wheel rim would be enough to fool the system's sensors into thinking you were holding it. Perhaps a little more development is needed there. Travel Assist can be added into Life and R-Line Spec Golfs at extra cost. Certain travel assist option packs can also include that side assist blind spot system. And if you've a Golf with a DSG Auto gearbox, your travel assist pack can also include a clever emergency assist setup, which can take over driving duties completely should you become incapacitated, steering the car to the side of the road and bringing it to a safe and gradual stop. Further safety options include a side airbag system for front and rear passengers and what Volkswagen calls proactive occupant protection, which uses sensors from the front assist setup to prepare the car to help you survive an impact if those sensors deem a collision to be inevitable. That'll mean your belts will be instantly pre-tensioned while the windows and the sunroof, if fitted, will be immediately closed. It's all very reassuring. This Golf 8 has evolved in so many ways, but if you were feeling particularly uncharitable towards it, you might be tempted to conclude that engine technology isn't one of them, not for the time being anyway. 
it launched as newly designed Golf generations tend to do with broadly the same mainstream power plants Volkswagen was offering to customers of older versions of the previous model though of course they've been fully updated to the latest Euro 60 temp emission standard. Before we delve down a little into the Wolfsburg brand's engine technology here, let's begin with delivering you the WLTP rated stats you'll need for the conventional volume variants that you're most likely to choose. For petrol people, both the entry level units, the 110 PS 3 cylinder 1 litre TSI and the 130 PS 4 cylinder 1.5 litre TSI deliver identical returns up to 53.3 miles the gallon on the combined cycle and up to 121 grams per kilometer of CO2, which to give you some class perspective is very similar to the kinds of readings you get from directly equivalent versions of main competitors. Here we've chosen to test a manual gearbox 1.5 TSI with the uprated 150 PS version of this engine in its conventional form and this variant does only fractionally worse returning up to 51.4 miles to the gallon and 124 grams per kilometre. A diesel would do better of course in terms of CO2 and MPG anyway especially one of the diesels freshly fitted to this Golf 8. Think black pump fueled engines are past it? Well, take a look at the TDI units used here, which are now all of 2 litres in size. The detuned 115 PS version of this new 2 litre TDI unit, which has replaced the previous 1.6 TDI power plant, manages up to 68.9 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and up to 107 grams per kilometre of CO2. And for the auto-only 2 litre TDI 150 PS variant, the figures are up to 64.2 miles to the gallon and 116 grams per kilometre, which by the way is uh, more than 10% better than you get from an equivalent Ford Focus 2 litre EcoBlue 150 PS auto model. These excellent figures have been aided by the introduction of so-called twin dosing catalytic converter technology, which features dual AdBlue injection, significantly increasing emissions cleanliness. With twin dosing, AdBlue is injected upstream of two SCR catalytic converters arranged in series, with the result of cutting emissions of nitrogen oxide by up to 80% compared with the previous 2 litre TDI engine. All well and good, but what about the electrified and eco-minded engine technology the industry's crying out for right now? From a cursory glance at the Golf 8 range for our market, you might wonder about that. The old battery-powered e-Golf is no more. The plug-in hybrid GTE version that I'll brief you on in a moment uses basically the same powertrain it's had since 2016, and we still can't have the natural gas CNG model that's been on sale on the continent for most of the last decade. What is new on the electrification front is the brand's latest 48 volt mild hybrid technology and when Volkswagen can offer this on all the car's volume petrol units it'll be a strong addition to the Golf's portfolio of virtues because according to the Wolfsburg engineers this so-called ETSI setup can improve your economy by up to 17 percent. The actual quoted WLTP figures don't fully reflect that suggesting that a 1.5 e TSI model can manage up to 49.2 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 130 grams per kilometre of CO2. Anyway, from launch, the effect of all this tech on golf sales was somewhat limited, given Volkswagen's decision to only offer it to buyers of the 1.5 litre TSI petrol variant prepared to pay more for both the higher 150 PS output and for a 7-speed DSG auto gearbox creating an ETSI badged variant with a plump asking price edging up towards £30,000. In case you didn't catch our brief resume of the mild hybrid tech in our driving experience section, it's worth quickly briefing you uh, that a Golf ETSI isn't any kind of Prius-like full hybrid. It can never run independently on electric power alone. Instead, the mild hybrid system's merely there to help recuperate energy, add a little extra acceleration boost and power the stop start system which is probably where you'll notice it most the start stop range begins at just under 14 miles an hour so you'll often find an ETSI engine golf coasting up to the end of a traffic queue a traffic light or a level crossing 
As with Ford's mild hybrid engines, this Volkswagen Group setup, which also features on rival Seat Leons and Skoda Octavias, is based around an integrated 48 volt BAS belt alternator starter generator. This powers a 12 volt main electrical setup in which a 48 volt compact lithium ion battery in the boot stores energy harvested via a Kurs kinetic energy recovery system. If you'd prefer a full hybrid with proper all electric capability, your dealer will refer you to the Golf GTE plug in variant that I mentioned earlier. This still uses the same 1.4 litre TSI petrol engine and 6 speed DSG auto gearbox as it had with the Golf Mark 7. But for this Mark 8 model, the 13 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery that drives this PHEV version's 85 kilowatt electric motor is now twice as big as before which is why this GTE's WLTP rated all electric driving range has increased substantially to 36 miles. In other words, if the vehicle will only be used for short commutes and recharged regularly overnight, it's quite conceivable that this GTE could be run almost entirely without fuel. And conceivably, if you get your charging regime right, on off-peak electricity that'll hopefully cost pennies rather than pounds to consume. The combined range of the petrol and electric motor is around 660 miles, making the GTE an ideal comfortable car for the really long journeys that would probably defeat a full EV like Volkswagen's ID3. And it'll charge much quicker than a full EV. Powering a PHEV Golf up from a domestic socket would take around five hours, but using a garage wall box, you'll be able to reduce your charging time period to around three and a half hours. What else? Um, well, whichever Golf variant you select, you can monitor its ongoing frugality via selectable consumption readouts on the left-hand side of the digital instrument binnacle screen, or via the vehicle section of the centre dash screen, where you can select since start, long term, and since refuel readouts on economy. Servicing? Uh, well, as usual with Volkswagen models, there's a choice of either fixed or flexible maintenance packages. You'll choose the fixed approach if you cover less than 10,000 miles a year, and with this, the car will typically be looked at every 12 months. If your daily commute is more than 25 miles, and your Golf will regularly be driven on longer distance journeys, you'll be able to work with a flexible regime that can see you traveling up to 18,000 miles between garage visits or every two years, whichever is sooner. What else? Uh, well, we like the fact that misfueling protection is standard across the range, so you won't be able to accidentally put petrol in your diesel Golf or vice versa. Less impressive is the three year 60,000 mile warranty cover. We can't see why Volkswagen couldn't extend that mileage limit to 100,000 miles since that's what you get on its mechanically very similar Caddy van model. Doing that though wouldn't give Volkswagen dealers so much of an opportunity to sell extended warranty packages. Uh, there's one for four years and 75,000 miles or if you plan to see a bit more of the world in your Golf, there's a five year 90,000 mile package. Whatever your decision, your car will come with three years of pan-European roadside assistance that has no mileage restriction. The paintwork warranty lasts for three years, and as you'd expect, this car is protected by a 12-year anti-corrosion package. The Golf GTE has a separate eight-year battery warranty, which also covers the battery for up to 100,000 miles. As usual with the Golf, you can expect some of the highest residuals available in the class. To be specific, if you choose a mainstream model and don't go too mad with extras, experts predict that after three years and 36,000 miles, you should be able to get nearly 50% of your original purchase price back, an impressive return on investment for a volume branded car in this class. Insurance groups, uh, well, for mainstream models, they start at 14E for the one litre TSI, think 17E or 18E for the 1.5 TSI 130 PS model. It's 19E or 20E for this 1.5 TSI 150 PS manual version and 20E or 21E for the 1.5 E TSI DSG auto variant. For the 2 litre TDI 115 PS diesel it's 17E or 18E and for the 2 litre TDI 150 PS auto it's group 22E or 23E.
more youthful and contemporary this Mark 8 Golf might be, but it's still very much a Golf, though quite a different kind of one. Where the old Mark 7 version of this design was radical in its engineering but conservative in its packaging, this 8th generation interpretation of this enduring model line is, to some extent, the precise opposite. Fortunately though for Volkswagen, the result turns out to be a very complete package. The Golf has always been slightly pricier than mainstream branded family hatch rivals, but to be frank, lesser versions have sometimes struggled to justify that premium. With this eighth generation model, we venture to suggest that you'll feel much happier about parting with the extra cash. And you might even feel that this Volkswagen is a better home for your money than a pricier premium branded model of this sort, the Audi A3, that shares nearly all of this car's engineering, for instance. All of which is just as well, because the difference in price between this car and the two volume brand VW Group hatches that also share most of a Golf's engineering, this Seat Leon and the Skoda Octavia, is now really significant. It's certainly bullish of Volkswagen to price this car directly against premium rivals like the BMW 1 Series and the Mercedes A-Class. We could also point out that there are plenty of rival models in this segment that offer more interior room or boot space, and a couple that are slightly more engaging to drive too. But there's lots to like here from a car that feels engineered to a depth that most rivals just can't match. Even the trendy new digitalized cabin manages to deliver a mature blend of form and function. And the safety kit, media features and autonomous driving tech are all cutting edge. All of which means that this is still, as a Golf always should be, a benchmark in its segment. A car that must feature highly on any family hatch buyer's shopping list. In short, this is still a Golf with all the model line heritage, depth of engineering and inherent quality that this badge has come to represent. So nothing's really changed, even if everything seems different. <laughs>